Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another post-election discussion co-sponsored by the William Allen White School of Journalism and Mass Communications and the KU Law School. We've put together a panel of experts from the Political Science Department, the Law School, and the School of Journalism and Mass Communications. They will each speak briefly, and then we will open the floor for your questions. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see a Q&A feature. Um, you can begin so many questions whenever you like, and Dean Maz and I will keep an eye on those questions and feed them to the panelists once their presentations conclude. I'll turn it over now to Dean Maza to introduce the panelists. Thank you, Ann. Appreciate it. Uh, the panelists agreed that we would not spend a great deal of time um, reviewing their CVs. Rest assured that they are all uh, well versed in the issues, uh, and we want to thank them for agreeing to participate. Uh, our panel uh, includes uh, Patrick Miller, who is an associate professor with the political science department here at KU, uh, Rick Levy, who is the J.B. Smith Distinguished Professor of Constitutional Law at the law school, Mark Johnson, who is a partner with the Dentons Law Firm and founder of that firm's Kansas City office. He's also an adjunct uh, member of the faculty for both the School of Journalism as well as the law school, and Lua Yule, who is a professor at the law school and is currently the faculty senate president. So again, thanks to all of you uh, for being with us here. Uh, let's start uh, with uh, Patrick. Uh, Patrick uh, is going to talk um, a little bit about what the recent events mean to our larger system of democracy. Now we're only giving them three to five minutes. Uh, so Patrick, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, give a political scientist three to five minutes to lament the decline of American democracy. Let's see what I can hit on, start my stopwatch. Um, so in thinking about this, this is actually a really big, very daunting topic actually. Um, you know, I, I thought about, well, what would be most appropriate for an audience that I think largely comes from the law school, journalism, and some political science background? Um, so I'll start with some big picture and then maybe end in my short period by hitting on some of the, what I think are the most immediately pressing issues. Um, so I want to start by putting out the idea that, you know, from a big picture perspective, democracy works best when we have a shared belief in rules, norms, and facts um, about elections, about what reality is, about political norms inside and outside of Congress. And I think most political scientists would tell you, or the legislative process doesn't have to be Congress. And most political scientists would tell you that successful democracies, stable democracies are ones where the different political parties, the different factions competing in the political system can all have this shared commonality and then use that to then compete for whatever they're advocating for in the political system. So in other words, democracy is going to work best when we all have some kind of commonality uh, about what we believe in and then operate out of that. Um, all of that is breaking down in the US right now in so many ways. Um, and so I think what's the most important stuff right now? And I think a lot of it is about the, immediately with the election and perception of reality around the election and the norms that are changing in relation to that. Uh, and I think there are numerous examples of this. And I wanna say that this is not something that just comes from the top. This is something that also comes from the bottom. Uh, we can't blame just our political leaders for all of this. A great example would be looking at public opinion in, in, in America about whether violence is justified as a political tool. Um, you know, if we look at the various polls that Pew, Gallup, political scientists have done in the last year, we see roughly about one third of Americans, and it cuts across both parties, roughly about one third of Americans will tell you that they think that violence is a justifiable political tool to win elections or to win policy fights. Um, those people tend to be stronger partisans, stronger ideologues on both sides of the political aisle. Um, that worries me, right? Um, I'm more worried about whether we're gonna make it through the next six months without political violence becoming more common, without assassinations, than I am quite frankly about what happened at the Capitol um, in January. But let's talk about that in particular. Um, you know, if we look again at public opinion, about 20% of Americans think that the events at the Capitol were justified, about half of Republicans think that that is justified. 
Um, and so you really have to think about, well, where does all this come, come, come from? And for me, it is the perception by a large percentage of Americans that they were somehow cheated um, in, in this process. And Pew has had some really interesting data that has shown that since the 2000 election, Americans only think that elections are fair and free when their side wins. That is an attitude that uh, both sides express that when we lose an election, of course, we were cheated. We like to see ourselves as the victims in that way. But I think on the Republican side of the aisle, on the more conservative side, you also have this narrative from Donald Trump, from more conservative media, that somehow the system is fraudulent and that this fraud has been used in particular to take elections away from Republicans. And I think that that says something about the evidence standards that exist in our political system. You know, in our courts, we like to think that the evidence standards are high. They're not always as high in the media. And I think we can think of a lot of examples where the media gives equal time to, you know, is global warming real or not? Is election fraud real or not? We don't, we don't have a problem with mass election fraud in the US, but yet the media entertains the question. Um, and in the court of public opinion, there's almost no evidence standard for believing what is fact or for believing what is a political issue, except for believing what is convenient. Um, whether you know, you're a Republican who thinks that fraud lost you the election or whether you are one of the roughly 60% of people who supported Bernie Sanders in 2016, who thinks that he got more votes than Hillary Clinton and that the DNC took the election away from him. Also not true. You know, we like to think that we lose because we're cheated. So I think that we have a problem with legitimacy in our democracy that spans the political aisle that quite frankly it's on americans it's on our political leaders and it's on the media to fix this and my time is up all righty thank you patrick appreciate it uh rick let's turn to you uh you're going to talk about uh the the role of law and possibly the role of lawyers um uh, in responding to some of the more recent events yeah, um, thanks very much, Stephen, and thanks to Patrick. That was very interesting, and I tend to agree with most of what he uh, said. I'm going to start by staking out a position uh, that I never thought would be controversial, and that is I am in favor of the rule of law. So cards on the table, I think the rule of law is good. Um, and uh, these days, I'm not sure that that is, going back to Patrick's point, I'm not sure there's a consensus in favor of the rule of law, perhaps most clearly reflected in support for violence as a potential political tool. Um, now, when I say the rule of law, what I mean is that the government operates by means of laws, that government actors are bound by laws, and that we have a legal system that interprets, applies, and enforces those laws. I think experience shows that when uh, uh, countries have the rule of law, people do better. That the rule of law promotes liberty, it protects rights, and contributes to peace and prosperity. I also think we're fortunate to live in a country that operates under the rule of law. Um, uh, countries without the rule of law, it's very difficult to build it. But my point would be the rule of law is also fragile. It's something we can easily take for granted. And uh, it can be lost because it depends on institutions and people who are in those institutions who respect and value the law. Um, if people are corrupt, if they're willing to engage in the naked assertion of power without regard to law, then the rule of law uh, is eroded and can eventually be lost. So going and, and, and relating this to current events or recent events, the orderly transfer of power in our democratic system depends on the rule of law. Um, it, it also exemplifies the rule of law because it reflects the willingness of people in positions of power to uh, give way to the demands uh, of the law. So the events of January 6th represent, in my view, a rule of law crisis. 
um, because I think the law regarding the outcome of the election was clear. It's clear that voting, counting, and certifications were all conducted in accordance with law. There's no factually or legally valid basis for the cho state's choice of electors or the certified results of the electoral college vote. It's clear by the very words of the constitution that Vice President Pence had absolutely no legal authority to reject the results of the electoral college vote. Um, and dozens of courts have rejected legal challenges to the election. There's been no evidence of any widespread voter fraud. So any effort to really challenge the results of the election was a choice to advance power over law. Uh, and I think it's important to understand that in context. So I would then add that I am especially disheartened by the behavior of lawyers uh, during these events who should know better. I'm not gonna name any individual lawyers, but I will emphasize that lawyers in the legal profession have a duty to protect the rule of law, a special responsibility that comes from our role as lawyers and from our legal training. And that that duty, that responsibility is especially present when someone needs to tell their clients or their friends or even themselves that what we would like is not in uh, compliance with the law. And in this regard, especially to the law students in the audience, I wanna highlight that this means professional ethics matter. If we view our ethical obligations as annoying requirements that we ignore when it's inconvenient, then we are personally engaged in undermining the rule of law and the consequences of our failure to abide by our professional ethics go beyond any particular case or dispute. They contribute to the larger erosion of the law and the legal system. And so I think in the period before January 6th and after January 6th, too many lawyers were willing to disregard their professional obligations, too willing to file baseless claims in court, too willing to propagate false claims in public, and too willing to support and even advocate lawless behavior. Conversely, I think the heroes of this story were the lawyers, judges, and officials who followed the law uh, fulfilled their ethical obligations and advised those in position of power to comply with their legal duties. So I'll close by just adding that I don't think the crisis is over. Um, and uh, while we narrowly escaped um, a demise of the rule of law, uh, it's still under assault, it's still being eroded. And so I ask everyone in the audience to take their own personal responsibility to support the rule of law and act in a professionally ethical manner, and in particular, speak truth to our friends. Thanks. Thank you, Rick. Really appreciate that. Uh, we'll now turn it over to uh, Mark Johnson, who is going to talk about uh, some impeachment-related issues. Mark. Stephen, thank, you. thank you, Stephen. Yes, I'm, I'm, this is going to be uh, far more prosaic than the uh, uh, than either what Patrick or, or Rick had to say, but I, I think we'll address a number of issues that some of you are thinking about. Uh, first, with respect to the impeachment process, if you think of it as a trial, you will be disappointed. It is not a trial in the sense that we lawyers think of a trial. Uh, it, you, you have two juries, if you will. There's the jury that's made up of the senators who are not uh, impartial by any means. Uh, and then there's the jury of public opinion. Uh, and the case will be tried to both of them. Uh, and I think it's quite likely you're going to see a split decision. In other words, uh, a jury of senators voting in one direction and a jury of made up of those of us in the public voting in another direction. So don't think of it as a trial. It's a process. It's a political process. That's the first point. The second point uh, and this is one that's been raised a number of times uh, recently, is that somehow this trial is too late. 
somehow the clock has run out. That is absolutely not the case. Think of it, and here, we're, here, here I'm going to ask you to put your lawyer caps on. Think of it uh, of January 20 like the deadline, the statute of limitations is running out. For those of us who are lawyers, we know that before, before the statute of limitations in a criminal case, the indictment has to be filed. In a civil case, the complaint has to be filed. The trial does not have to take place before the statute of limitations expires. So think of it that way. That, that shows, I believe, that the trial, even though it's going to take place after January the 20th, is not unconstitutional. It's not too late. Third, many people are asking, why is it that the Chief Justice is not presiding? Well, the provision of the Constitution that addresses who is supposed to preside over the trial only mentions that the Chief Justice presides of an impeachment trial of a president. Donald Trump is no longer president. And so it is absolutely appropriate for the Senate to select someone else to preside. And in this case, they selected Senator Leahy, the president pro tem. Uh, and since 1949, the president pro tem has been the longest serving senator of the majority party. So if you ask why do they have such a senior person sitting there, it's because Senator Leahy is the longest serving Democrat uh, uh, in the US Senate. With respect to the defenses, I already talked about one of them, the, I, the sort of the too late defense, which, uh, which, which really has no, uh, in, in my opinion, no merit. And I'm basing the defenses on the brief that the president's lawyers filed yesterday. Their first one is, it's unconstitutionally too late. That holds no water. The second is that the president had a First Amendment right to say what he said. Well, that depends on whether he went too far in what he said uh, and um, violated what we call the Brandenburg standard. There's a case the Supreme Court decided a number of years ago in which it said that the government can prohibit people from intentionally inciting uh, listeners, their, their uh, audience, to engage in imminent lawless conduct. Was the president doing that? That's one of the things that's going to be tried in, this, in the Senate. Uh, and then finally, they, they will say, if he didn't have a First Amendment right to say what he said, he didn't incite. Uh, and I think there, there's the, there is some merit to that it, because his language is somewhat ambiguous. You know, he's, he, he's, uh, he did, did he say, go to the Capitol, break into the Capitol? No, he didn't. So whether the president intended to incite the crowd is going to be something that certainly uh, will have to be proved by evidence. And this is a, what's really very interesting about the trial we're going to see is it looks like we're going to see witnesses. I mean, the, uh, the, the House managers today called for the president to testify. I will predict he will not testify, certainly in their case. It would be, uh, I, I, think, I, I think it's a mistake for the House managers to call the president, but I don't think he'll, he'll show. Uh, but I think they will call plenty of witnesses. I think we're going to see a lot of video evidence. It's probably going to take a couple of weeks. Is it going to change any, uh, the mind of any of the senators? I doubt it. Uh, and then finally, the, uh, the, the, the process will play out. And some people ask, why is it that, they, that they're, they're doing this? He's already out of office. Well, remember one, one provision of the Constitution that still really is uh, uh, at, at play here, and that's uh, the 14th Amendment, Section 3, that says that anyone who has engaged against insurrection against the United States cannot hold a position, cannot hold an elective position going forward unless the Senate, by a three-fifths, uh, pardon me, a two-thirds majority, absolves them of that. And so if, he, if the president is convicted, he would not be allowed to run for office unless the Senate uh, affirmatively voted to allow him to do that. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pass the baton, but I just thought I'd address some issues that I think some people are thinking about.
Thank you, Mark. I want to remind everyone, uh, we already have several uh, questions and comments in the Q&A feature, but if you would like uh, to go ahead and uh, submit those questions, we would be happy to go ahead and take a look at them. So I will turn it over to uh, Professor Yule uh, to, to speak. Thanks. Um, so I guess it's been a, a couple months since the election. Uh, and shortly after the election, uh, I had a conversation with my father. And uh, afterwards, he came back to me a little later and he said, you know all that stuff you were saying about democracy? And I said, yeah, mm -hmm, I know all that stuff I was saying about democracy. It's like, maybe you should write that stuff down instead of ranting about it to your dad. Um, so I haven't <laughs> made it there yet, but I feel like this is a first <laughs> step. <laughs> At least I have an audience uh, of more than one unwilling father <laughs> in my kitchen. Um, and uh, I wanna share with you something that I actually am not surprised or wouldn't, won't be surprised if you find is a little bit radical. Um, as I listened to uh, Rick, Mark, and Patrick, I heard a couple of things. I heard that we don't trust democracy, that we don't agree about what democracy is, that we have injected no small measure of political theater into democracy. And I heard about you know pretty strong pleas for a return to some sort, a recognition of those disagreements, a process of trying to get to some common ground and a return to that space and leaning and asking us to lean into that space so that we can have a carefully agreed upon functioning democracy um, that maybe goes under the guise of the rule of law. Well, why did I say what I'm going to say is probably a little bit controversial then, um, <laughs> based on what you've heard. I don't believe in the rule of law. I've never believed in the rule of law. And that comes directly uh, from the fact that the law carefully applied, consistently applied, has carefully and consistently operated to marginalize, oppress, and exclude huge swaths of society. And indeed, the rule of law has been a major obstacle, in my view, to achieve, achieving something, right, <laughs> that at least approximates the kinds of shared beliefs about rules, norms, and facts that Patrick said are necessary for democracy to function well. But I get worse than that. Not only do I not believe or trust the rule of law as anything other than a utopian myth, I don't even know that I think we want democracy. What's so great about democracy? Okay, 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 okay. don't get mad at me yet. I want to actually suggest that we should have two different concepts when we're discussing these sorts of big, weighty, hard political conversations. We should have capital democracy and we should have lowercase democracy. And here's where, and I still think this is controversial, here's where I suggest that we need to open up the world to new conversations. On one side, sometimes of the political spectrum, but on one side of our conversation, we have a lot of folks who believe deeply in what I'm gonna call capital democracy. Democracy over the structure, the fundamental institutions, and the core features of a political system, if you're a person uh, like my colleague, Rick Levy, you might call that constitutional principles, right? Democracy over the constitution. And you've got people who really believe that. Those are people who suggest maybe we shouldn't let people vote because if we let people vote, then my guy's not going to win. Those are people who think that it should be up for democratic decision whether, say, Black people, people who look like me, should be a part of our political process, should be protected by laws. That's capital democracy, de democracy of a constitutional level. I also think we should start to have a conversation about something else, which is small democracy. And little d democracy is something that I believe strongly in. Little d democracy is, should we build a highway? 
Should we have free freeways or should we have tolls? What should be the content of the state sponsored curriculum, right? These kinds of things that structure our day to day lives that are really important. But reasonable minds could differ. That's the kind of democracy I believe in. That's the kind of democracy we should fight for. But the battle has been around big D democracy. And I'm not convinced that we get anything good from big D democracy in the same way. I'm not sure that we've gotten anything good from fealty to something called the rule of law. That's what I got for you. Thank you. Appreciate that. So um, uh, again, uh, keep uh, feeding your questions. Um, Patrick, I, I'm going to start with a question for you. And, oh, and by the way, um, uh, our, our speakers, I, I'd like to wrap up um, by asking uh, each of you towards the end uh, what we can be optimistic about going forward. So for the next several, you know, 15 minutes or so while we're answering these other questions, give some thought. Uh, to that question. I think that'd be a nice uh, ra uh, wrap up. Uh, but uh, Patrick, um, what can we expect uh, going forward in terms of redistricting? Oh boy. Um, well, first the entire process is going to be delayed because of the delay in census numbers, which I believe will not be given to the states for basic apportionment until April now. Um, in terms of what to expect, you know, fitting this into the, into the conversation besides just the normal redrawing of lines. Um, the process to become far more political than it probably has in the past. There, you know, there's been an interesting trend where Democrats like to disarm their ability to gerrymander. They throw it away through nonpartisan redistricting and Republicans don't. So Democrats aren't going to be in an awesome position to quite frankly gerrymander many states. Um, Republicans will. Um, I think looking into the crystal ball, Republicans could retake control of the House just based on redistricting alone, given where they have that control. Um, I also think pertaining to this audience that you're probably going to see a lot happening with redistricting that's going to be going into the courts. You know, you've already started to see the foundation set for that with some of the court cases around, um, you know, one person, one vote, who should count for the drawing of district lines, should you count ineligible voters like non-citizens or children. Um, I think one of the things that we're probably going to see a fair bit of, again, looking into the crystal ball is probably some cases around um, the drawing of majority minority congressional districts on both ends of that. Um, both some attempts to eradicate those um, and some attempts to pack those even further, depending upon the politics of certain areas. Uh, so I think for this audience, there'll be a lot to probably look at in terms of what's coming into the courts out of that process. So thanks, Patrick. Um, question from the audience from Mark and or Rick. Um, in analyzing whether Donald Trump incited the January 6th riot, is it enough to simply examine his words as we would any other citizen slash defendant, or can it be argued that Donald Trump is different from a regular citizen in that he has a unique responsibility as president of the United States to consider the potential consequences of his words? Mark, Rick. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start um, uh, because I had a thought also this relates to when Mark was talking, because I, I don't think the Brandenburg standard is the proper standard to apply to an impeachment. The, the Brandenburg standard deals with uh, criminal statutes and the imposition of, of, of criminal liability um, and, and not whether a president has uh, committed a high crime uh, or misdemeanor. And I was also, I don't want to get into too much First Amendment law, but insofar as the president was apparently speaking as president, um, the, in your official position as a government actor, you have no free speech rights. Um, and your employer has a right to dictate what you can say. And so in this context, I'm just not sure whether the Brandenburg standard is the correct one. But I do think when the Brandenburg test says that it's, uh, words must be directed towards inciting imminent 
um, uh, unlawful conduct and likely to incite such conduct. I, I think there's nothing in that formulation that requires the language to be explicit. Go do this. Um, the question involves one of intent. Was the intention to um, uh, create imminent unlawful conduct? And was that unlawful conduct likely to occur? Um, intentions, you have to read into the context of what was being said. Um, you can't just go by uh, the words. And I think in terms of likelihood, there is where the unique position of Donald Trump as president of the United States would likely be especially significant because his words carry special weight and are especially likely to move his followers uh, to take action. Yeah, all I would add to that is uh, I, I do agree with Rick that the Brandenburg standard um, probably doesn't technically apply here. I think that the Republicans are going to argue it vociferously in, in, uh, in, in trying to make the point that he did not violate the standard, therefore he can't be impeached. I mean, I think that's the point they're going to make. Uh, but to me, a powerful piece of evidence on intent is what he did what, after the Capitol was invaded. What did he do? If one would think that if he did not intend to incite the crowd, he would have immediately taken action to try to get things back under control. And by all indications, and we've all heard this secondhand, thirdhand, it will be interesting to see if the House managers have any direct eyewitness testimony on this, but by all indications, not only did he do nothing, but he had to be, uh, uh, you know, you know, he went, uh, you know, uh, sort of philosophically or, or, or metaphorically kicking and screaming to issue a, a, a rather, you know, watery statement about let's, you know, let's all go home, even though I think you're special people and we love you. So does that, does that, uh, to me, that uh, would certainly be uh, uh, something that, that lends to an argument that what happened is what he intended to happen. Okay. Uh, we have a question from uh, David. Uh, what would you say are some big similarities and differences between the Black Lives Matter rallies in 2020 and the Capitol building riots uh, in January? Anybody want to comment on that one? I would say it's not a useful exercise to it, compare um, and consider in parallel um, protests um, and an insurrection that results in the siege of the Capitol building. And this is coming from the person <laughs> who just said, <laughs> rule of law, shmule of law. <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, very different. Um, one set of activities was really designed not to rest power or to undermine the existing structure. It wasn't, uh, it, there was no part of it that was considered, uh, let's do a revolution. Instead, it was, let's engage in the political process by demanding change in the government versus let's take them hostage so that we do what we want. Now, I'm not saying that every single person uh, uh, was, was engaged in that way, but we've got a lot of film of a lot of people who said that that's what they're doing and then we're in the capitol building trying to do that versus you know people who are standing outside chanting but more important than that right how one set of protests uh is about engaging what has already been sanctioned um and you know the violence associated therewith was really <laughs> about, uh, frankly, discomfort with who was making a claim for what um, versus uh, not actually designed as a protest or not actually 
enacted as a protest. I'm not willing to say uh, what was designed, but and I and I just keep asking, what do we get by comparing and contrasting? That's like saying, let's compare a football game um, to cricket. Hmm. I'm not sure what I learned. I, I would just make the point that we should not fall victim. We should not fall into the trap of accepting accepting the premise of the question. It's a false equivalence to say Black Lives Matter was somehow comparable. The, the demonstrations last summer were somehow comparable to what happened on January the 6th. And then we'll go to Patrick. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I would just say really quickly, uh, talking over Patrick, I, um, th that there is a difference. And the difference is the uh, military police response to the Black Lives Matter protests versus the lack of response to the insurrection. So to me, that's a useful point of comparison. How did, how did law enforcement respond to the two different events? Um, and it seems to me that they were backwards. So I, I think there's a lot, a lot that can be said about the substance of this and should we even be making the comparison. But I think to me, as a political scientist, the politics of the comparison stands out. You know, I think of Black Lives Matter and the protests around that, which were often driven from the grassroots, raising an issue that often elected officials, the elites, the people in power don't or haven't wanted to address versus what we saw in DC, which, you know, it came a bit from the grassroots, it came a bit from the top, but I think about the politics of that. And you had people at the top of the system actively creating this myth that mass voter fraud exists, that it was used to steal an election a media establishment, a me sector of the media aided and abetted that lie over the course of years. And so you think about the politics of that. They created an audience for this myth that believes in it. And that audience showed up at the Capitol and tried to stop the certification of the electoral vote process. And then many of those same politicians then put themselves in the position they claim to be the defenders of the concerned. So it, it's, it's a very different political situation to me than what we saw with Black Lives Matter in, in that dynamic between the people taking part in, in the protests and the people at the top. Louis, did you wanna make another comment or shall we go on to another question? I see you've unmuted. Okay. I just wanna... Oh, I'm sorry. That was me being a poor participant. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Anne. <laughs> okay, another question from the audience. Um, a number of people have suggested that the tone of political discourse would be improved if the fairness doctrine was reinstated. Others believe the fairness doctrine, or some form of it, is an unconstitutional constraint, constraint on free speech. Whose argument do you think is most appropriate? Rick, are you willing to start on this one? Sure, I'll start on it. Um, I, I... I think reinstituting the fairness doctrine would have zero effect on the tone of, uh, uh, of political discourse because it always only applied to broadcast. Um, and uh, it never applied to uh, internet, Facebook, newspapers, et cetera. And it could not constitutionally be applied to those media. It was, it was only valid as a constitutional matter for um, uh, television and radio on the assumption um, that those were scarce commodities affected with the public interest that were licensed by the federal government. And um, so it wouldn't apply to cable television. It wouldn't apply to anything on the internet, wouldn't apply to social media. So it would have zero effect on, on political discourse. P broadcast TV is not where the problem is. I would just say that I agree with that. And I think the deeper issue is that there is a huge chunk of Americans on, again, both sides of the political spectrum that have an appetite for media that they know is going to reinforce their political point of view that is not going to challenge them. Um, you know, we have some great survey data in political science where increasingly Americans are saying that something even like news that presents two sides of a political story is biased and that news is somehow more fair, more objective, and it only gives you one point of view. 
that's the kind of attitude I think is the deeper problem that you can't really solve through a, a piece of legislation. Okay. Um, uh, Professor Yule, we have a, a question from Alex directly to you. Uh, when you talk about lowercase d democracy and civic participation in the development of, of legal rules that impact people directly, uh, how do you imagine this civil participation can be structured? Can the current political system of representational democracy accommodate this? Uh, and how may we expand the current system? Um, I don't actually, I, I think there's lots of ways to go about this. Um, and I'm, I'm probably breaking the rules again, but there's a question down uh, further along that asks, okay, in trying to get this lowercase democracy, do we abandon the constitution? Do we have, you know, uh, dictators, benevolent or otherwise? I think that those are questions open for discussion. And I think my, my important point and the important takeaway is that it is normatively good. I think it's a good idea for people to be intimately involved, whether it's through a representational situation. I really am excited and have been for, I guess, like 20 years now in democratic experimentalism, which is really like committee-based local level governance that then gets iterated into broader and broader contexts. But I think we should be open to exploring how you do it. But the point is we want robust democracy with participation and that's consultative and it's fine for it to be majoritarian in the lowercase sense. I am tired of having up for debate the humanity of large swaths of our population. And I really think that our current crisis ongoing, as Professor Levy says, is about whether group and group after, after group of people. And I think that's the important for me, distinction and exciting place to explore how we organize government. Thank you. Um, I think this is a question for Mark. If a president is convicted, is an additional majority vote of the Senate required to ban him or her from further federal office? Uh, well, the best, best place to go is where we find it in the Constitution. And it's, the, uh, it, it's in the 14th Amendment. Uh, and um, actually, Congress it does not have to take an additional vote to disqualify him from further office, Congress has to take an additional vote to allow him or her, as the case may be, to run for office. The last sentence of section three of the 14th Amendment says, but Congress may by a vote of two thirds of each house remove such disability. So there has to be, a, a, actually, I, I said earlier the Senate, I was wrong. It's both the Senate and the House have to affirmatively vote. Now, of course, this was passed in order to deal with all of the uh, people who had fought for the Confederacy. That was the intent, but the language applies to this situation. Thanks, Mark. Uh, can Rick, I, did you can have I a follow offer a, Yeah, I, I just wanna offer a point of clarification. There's actually two different provisions on disqualification. There's a provision in the impeachment clause that says that um, a set would require a separate vote of the Senate that can have as a consequence of an impeachment disqualification uh, from office. Um, disqualification under the 14th Amendment is limited to insurrection or waging war. I don't remember the exact language of it, um, but it would only follow from a, an impeachment and conviction for um, essentially insurrection against the United States and other types of impeachable offenses would not automatically trigger the 14th Amendment. So we'd have to look and see exactly what it is that Trump was convicted of before we could decide whether he was automatically disqualified under the 14th Amendment. Well, in, in order to deal with that, the uh, article of impeachment does uh, include a reference to uh, the 14th Amendment, Section 3. So they're trying, the, the House managers are trying to work this in. 
Uh, so Rick, we have a, a question from a, a good friend of ours. Um, she, she notes that you mentioned that legal ethics um, should have come into play. Uh, do you think that there's any expectation that any of the lawyers who filed uh, or pursued any of the frivolous suits relating to election fraud, do you think any of them will be disciplined by their state bars? Well, I think that there's, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert on the specific ethical rules that might lead to, to disciplinary action. I, I do know that in some of the uh, cases that were brought, um, the public rhetoric outside the courthouse was quite different than the factual allegations that were being made inside the courthouse. And I think that was a product of ethical norms and, and beyond that, the possibility of serious sanctions by the, from, from the courts if you misrepresent uh, facts to them. Um, my recollection is that there have been, uh, for example, large numbers of uh, attorneys who have uh, filed or uh, published calls for uh, disbarment of uh, multiple uh, public actors uh, uh, on this field. Um, but my, my guess would be it would take a very unusual and extreme case before we'll see any real disciplinary action in, in, in these matters, which is part of our, our problem as a profession. Just like other professions, we're, we're, we're probably too reluctant to police ourselves. Um, uh, to the detriment of the public. So for anyone, we are seeing a flurry of bills being introduced in um, state legislators regarding voting rights, um, procedures, processes. Um, anybody care to comment on the viability of these, especially in light of um, other suits that were brought and dismissed by courts and um, maybe even some speculation about what you think is behind all these bills? Well, um, under, under the Constitution, the states uh, determine who gets to vote and, and, and how uh, elections are uh, conducted and when they take place and the like. So uh, the, um, uh, the, the efforts to change the election rules, um, I think, have a uh, very strong, uh, in, in many cases, probability of passage. I think that the sense that a lot of the a mail-in balloting that we saw this year may not be around in the next election cycle. I also don't think we need to guess what's behind it. Um, I, I don't know if it was yesterday, my, de my days in the COVID world are blending together, but we had the Georgia uh, uh, GOP um, official who said, you know, they say, they said the quiet part aloud, which is we need to change these rules so that we will have fewer people voting so that we can win. And, and unfortunate, very unfortunately, um, the court has, I don't know if I think it's fair to say has made it clear uh, in terms of the actual interpretation of the actual law, but in its actions, quite clear that you can engage in voter suppression as long as it's not based on categorical factors, right? You can't try to get black people not to vote, but you can definitely or Latinx people not to vote, or LGBTQIA people not to vote, maybe, uh, but you can definitely try to not get the other side to vote. And as you know, Patrick talked about, one, one side of our uh, binary system, one side exercises and works to try to make that happen, and the other side, for whatever reason, good or bad, um, doesn't seem to engage in that as much. But I think the, the motivations are clear. Um, and they're saying them out loud because that is politically acceptable in a way that even 25 years ago, you couldn't, you wouldn't say that out loud. You needed to say it at a secret meeting. Now you say it in front of people, you put it in a TikTok um, and people are like, yay, I will vote for you because we don't all believe in democracy. We like to say that word, but we don't actually believe in it. Even folks who, who are not like me and trying to make these fine distinctions. I mean, there's obviously a lot happening at the state level. I mean, I think some of and coordinated, right? I mean, we're in some cases we're seeing identical bills being introduced across states. Um, some of the things I think are, are less likely. So something like the Arizona bill that was just introduced that would give the legislature the ability to toss out the popular vote even after the certification of the election up to the point where Congress counts the electors 
something like that a little less likely. I think that where we are going to see a lot of state action is things like eliminating mail ballots or at least eliminating no excuse absentee voting, um, banning ballot uh, drop boxes, several states doing that, um, banning mail ballot collection, which you know I think is discriminatory against Native Americans on reservations in particular, but uh, also presents issues for the disabled, the elderly. Um, and also I think one area we're also not used to thinking about, but I think that this election should really highlight you know, conservatives in particular are making a strong push both through the courts and through state legislatures to limit local control of elections. Uh, and even in some places like Wisconsin and Georgia to limit the ability of independently elected secretaries of state to act on elections and instead to centralize that power in the state legislature. Um, and I think that's kind of an area where we have we're not as used to hearing in the voter suppression voting rights debate, but I think it's gonna become a very important one because it's gonna eliminate possibly the ability of localities to make voting more flexible for citizens. Yeah, Rick. So I would, I would uh, agree with what, what's been said, but I would add a couple of points. First of all, although the Supreme Court has said pretty much any kind of politically motivated voter suppression effort is okay. If it goes too far, like requiring proof of citizenship in order to register uh, to vote, uh, for example, the Kansas law was invalidated. So there's a, 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 a threshold uh, above which burdens can be excessive. Uh, but the second point is, although the constitution places responsibilities for electoral stuff in the states in the first instance, Congress does have authority to enact legislation um, that supersedes, at least in federal elections, the provisions of, uh, of the states. And uh, it has authority under the 15th Amendment uh, to, uh, to, to implement uh, uh, race-neutral uh, uh, race uh, voting rules. So, um, one possible response would be to, to seek federal legislation on these issues in, in order to address and, and facilitate votes. Mark, did you have a? I just have, I just have one point and, and that is, it, it, it's not all a bleak picture. There, there, uh, there, there is a, a piece of legislation that's pending in Congress, HR1, that actually, since the uh, Democrats took over the Senate, has a reasonable chance of passage. What the, Dem what the Democrats have to do is to decide whether they want to keep the filibuster in the Senate. If they're willing to let that go, then that legislation will pass. Biden will sign it. It has all sorts of electoral forms in it, including uh, a new formula for uh, application of the Voting Rights Act. So we'd get back to the pre-Shelby County days when several states had to clear any change in their uh, electoral practices. I think one of the questions asked in the chat was about the likelihood of some kind of renewal of preclearance or the Voting Rights Act. Um, and I agree with exactly what, with what was just said. That can easily pass the House, but you cannot get that through the Senate on reconciliation. Um, if Democrats want to pass that, you have to kill the filibuster and keep all your 50 votes and, and have the vice president break the tie. Um, if the filibuster remains intact, then I think the hopes of, of any kind of federal legislation addressing voting rights or election reform are precisely zero um, in this Congress. So um, I, I would point out the, what, the, the one piece of legislation that has been another it, it, uh, that has been proposed by the Republicans would, uh, Rick, uh, overturn the uh, documentary proof of citizenship decision that we we got in the case that I tried. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't resist. So we've got about six minutes left. Mark, uh, are you most optimistic about the, the possibility of, of getting this legislation through? Yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic about it, but boy, giving up the filibuster is a huge and very difficult decision. Uh, but, you know, Stephen, you, you asked us, uh, are there, is there anything we're optimistic about? Um, I'm optimistic about the fact that without regard to a concerted, consistent, 
tough effort to overturn the election, it didn't happen. That there were plenty of people who were willing to stand up without coordinating with each other. There's no reason to think that the judges in Pennsylvania talked to Raffensperger in, uh, uh, in Georgia or to the Secretary of State of Arizona or to Governor Ducey in Arizona. It was, all, it was completely without coordination, but they all did the right thing at the right time. And so um, I think it shows that our system is actually as durable as the people who are willing to stand up. Lua, do you want to go next? You want me to be optimistic and you gave yeah. me a whole bunch of time to think about it. You know what I'm optimistic about? I'm optimistic about, you know, we talk about, or I mentioned, right, saying the quiet part aloud. I'm optimistic that the more we hear the quiet part from all cross uh, spaces, you've got, you motivate people who are, right, Mark talked about, we're as strong as the people who are willing to, to, to defend uh, something that they see that's good in our existing system. Um, and when we hear the quiet part aloud, when we see uh, the way that responses to different kinds of political engagement, legitimate and illegitimate, look different for different people in our system, um, people are talking about that. And I'm really uh, optimistic about those conversations and about folks no longer blindly having faith um, in values that we're not living and because they don't blindly have faith in them, uh, being willing to have some conversations about how to make uh, something better or something that that works for everybody. Right. Patrick, you want to go next and then we'll let Rick wrap it up. So I think my reason for optimism is probably the same as Mark's in that we survived. Um, you know, I, I, I think when we think about how we as political scientists study the decline of democracy, it's not always the fall of democracy. It can be just becoming a less democratic country. It's not like it happens all at once, right? It's not like the knife is just stabbed in and you fall over dead. Democracy dies from cut, 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 and you bleed a little, you bleed a little more, and eventually just bleeds out. Um, and we see that time and time again in countries that have transitioned from democracy to not democracy or whether democracies have just weakened, that it is a slow weakening process. And so I think surviving this election for all the reasons that Mark said, you know, election officials in both parties, even members of Congress in both parties, preserving the integrity of the system, it gives us more time to talk about the importance of that system before we have an election where it doesn't end so well, um, quite frankly. So I think that is what I am optimistic about, that the resolution of this brought more time. And I think in particular, if you wanna get into more practical politics, I'm optimistic, you don't have to agree with them. I'm op optimistic about the Lynn Cheney's and the Adam Kinzinger's and Mitt Romney's of the Republican party trying to reassert some degree of control um, from where it has gone in the Trump years, which landed us at the Capitol insurrection. Rick. Well, I think my optimism sort of draws on a lot of the same themes that other people have, have drawn on. Um, I, I, I do feel like the last actually 10 to 12 years have uh, brought out into the open a lot of our most serious uh, problems. Uh, they made it much more difficult for um, uh, people like me, uh, you know, old white guys to say, hey, there's no problem with misogyny. There's no problem with racism. There's no, you know, we're, we live in a, 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 a just and fair society. I think that there was a lot of denial uh, in the past about very deep problems uh, in, in our society. And, and, you know, it may be painful, but I think that a lot of, uh, of that has been exposed. The, the bandage has been ripped off. We've, we sort of see the problems. And I, as difficult and painful as that is, I don't think you can begin to repair those problems until you acknowledge that they exist. And I think as this um, uh, presentation has shown, 
we've we've had our nose rubbed in it. We can't ignore the problems that exist anymore. And so maybe now people will uh, roll up their sleeves and get to work. That's great. Uh, Anne, shall I wrap, wrap it up? Well, I just want to thank the panelists and um, thank you, Dean Mazza, for coming up with this idea and then reaching out to the School of Journalism Mass Communications to co-sponsor. And dare I suggest in a few weeks, we may want to reconvene to deconstruct the trial. Yeah, I think uh, that, that sounds like a great idea. Uh, I also want to thank our panelists. Y'all were terrific. Uh, thank uh, everyone who uh, asked questions. Sorry, we couldn't get to all of those. Um, and thank everybody at home for uh, tuning in. So we may see you again. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>